Well, I hope by now you've had a good sense of the meaning and purpose of this night and the joy that we have in celebrating the birth of the Savior. And we want to spend a few moments reflecting on that now. And as we uh, prepare to do that, let us pray. Dear God, we once again give you our thanks and praise because you have not left us on our own. Rather, you came to us in Jesus. And in him we see the fullness of your love for us. And thank you that through Jesus we can be made right with you and have a relationship with you. So we have so much to be grateful for and to rejoice in. And as we continue now to think on the meaning of the events of this night, Lord, we pray that your spirit will be our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. Said the night wind to the little lamb. Do you see what I see? As we just heard sung for us. Do you see what I see? That's really a very insightful question, isn't it? Because the truth is we can all look at the same thing, the same object, the same event, and we can see different things. So I have a few slides we're going to look at today, and we'll put the first one up there on the screen now. And so... What do you see? Well, you can all tell, I'm sure, that that is a cornfield. But what do you see? Well, probably that's all we see, isn't it? A cornfield. But if you were a farmer, and especially if you were a farmer who raises corn, you would see more than just a cornfield. You could look at this picture and you could see whether or not that corn is healthy. You could see if the corn has had too much rain, too little rain, or just the right amount of rain. A farmer might look at this picture and and say, well, I can see that in about two weeks that corn will be ready for harvesting. The farmer would see things in this picture that we don't see, even though we're looking at the same picture. Well, here's a different one. Now, what do you see? You may recognize this, depending on a little bit of your background, but this is one of the images that's used in the Rorschach psychological test. Sometimes it's just called the inkblot test. It's a series of ten images that are kind of like this. They're basically just blots of ink that are folded, and then they, they are, look the same on, on each side. And uh, they, they're, so they're not really pictures of anything, but people see different things in these images. A little more than 20 years ago, as Danielle and I were interviewing to uh, be accepted as missionaries with our denomination back in the United States, they sent us away for several days to a counseling center for psychological testing to see if they thought we would hold up on the mission field. And one of the tests that we took uh, during that time was this the Rorschach test. Now, we didn't take it together. We had to take it separately, just one-on-one with a psychologist. I'm a kind of a concrete left brain person. So when I see an image like this, I I, I was really struggling to to tell him what I saw. Uh, If you were, because I want to see some some kind of thing in that picture, a specific thing. And so if you were like me, maybe you would look at this picture and and you see the two gray images and maybe it kind of could be two elephants that are facing each other and with their trunks raised in kind of an elephant high five. Or you may look at the, the white space there in between them and it looks like some maybe some fire coming down below and it may be some sort of a spaceship taking off. So those are the sorts of answers that I gave. After taking the test, I asked the psychologist what people who think differently than me see in pictures like this. And he said, oh, some people see anger. Some people see rage. Some people see joy. I don't see those things at all in these images, but that's what some people see. Afterwards, I asked Daniela, who is more of a right-brained person, what she saw, and she said, oh, I saw a party. (laughs) I didn't see that. 
We look at the same image, but we see different things. Well, how about this one? What do you see? Well, we can all see that that is a a mountain scene, and there's a a few buildings down there in the uh, front part of the uh, picture, so maybe it's some kind of a mountain lodge or a mountain resort somewhere. But when I look at this picture, what I see is Camp Judson in the Black Hills of South Dakota. I see the place where, as a 14-year-old camper, I became a Christian. When I look at this picture, I see the place that changed my life. I see holy ground. I see the place where not only I, but literally thousands of young people over the years have come to know Jesus as their Savior. Thousands more have been encouraged in their faith. Because of my personal experience there, I see things in that picture that there's no way that you could see. Well, uh, one last picture. What do you see? What do you see? Different people looking at this picture will see different things. Now, the thing that comes to mind, I'm sure, for all of us, the first thing probably that comes to mind is that this is a picture of the nativity when Christ was born. All the the characters are there. You can see a few shepherds there in front with a a few sheep off to the side. And of course, that's Mary in the back there. And to the right would certainly be Joseph. And obviously, the infant lying on the hay is uh, the infant Jesus with the bright light shining upon him. Of course, we don't know exactly what it looked like the night that Jesus was born, but this is how one artist depicted it, and we recognize it as that. And that's all that some people will see in this picture, just a portrayal of the night of Jesus' birth. But actually, this picture reveals so much more than just the birth of Jesus. If we look at this picture thoughtfully, if we take time to reflect on what really took place that night, we see so much more than just the birth of Jesus. If we look carefully at this picture, what we really see is God reaching out to us. What we see in this picture is God inviting us to know Him. God inviting us to have a relationship with Him, to be with Him and to experience His goodness for all eternity. And there are several ways that God reached out to us through the birth of Jesus. First of all, God was reaching out to us through the birth of Jesus because there we see the revelation of who God is and what God is like. God, of course, is spirit, so we cannot see God. By looking at God's creation from the vast universe to the microscopic intricacies of each living self, we can tell that God must be very powerful and very wise. But how could we ever know what God is like in terms of his character? Is God loving or spiteful? Is God caring or unconcerned? Is God merciful or harsh? Is God holy or carnal? We could make some guesses about that. And different religions throughout history have come to different conclusions about who God is and what God is like. But how could we ever know for sure what God is like? Well, God hasn't left us wondering who he is or what he is like. He came to us in the only way that we would really be able to see and understand. He came to us as one of us, as a human being. In the birth of Jesus, along with his life and then his death and his resurrection, we see the love and the compassion of God. We see the grace and truth of God. We see the mercy and the holiness of God. Colossians 2 verse 9 tells us, For in Christ 
All the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Again, God is spirit, so we cannot see him. So he came to us in a bodily form. He came to us as one of us. And as this passage says, all that is true of God was present in Jesus. And so, in looking at and reflecting on Jesus, we see what God really is like. You know, we can't have a relationship with someone if we don't know who they are. And if we don't know what they're like. We may start a relationship with someone, but if we don't really know what they're like, later we'll find out, and then that relationship ends. But by coming to us in Jesus, the one true God was reaching out to us and inviting us to himself, for in Jesus, God was saying to us, this is who I am. In a sense, this was God introducing himself to us. So when we look at a picture of the nativity scene, this is what we see. God reaching out to us by revealing himself to us so that we can know God truly. Second, and related to that, we see in this picture of God reaching out to us through his humility. As we know, human beings who have high positions, whether they're royalty or politicians or celebrities or the ultra-rich, typically they like to enjoy the perks that come with their high position. Lavish homes and luxury cars, adoring fans and access to the best seats at the best events with no waiting in line. They enjoy VIP treatment. They live in a world that we cannot enter. They live in a world that we can only dream of. And rarely, if ever, do they enter the world that most of us live in. Typically, they like to keep their distance from ordinary people. They may even have security guards to make sure that regular people don't get too close to them. And thus, we have no relationship with those people how amazingly different it is with God. God, the creator of the universe, who eternally dwells in unimaginable splendor, entered this broken, fallen world. God did not keep his distance from us, but rather he came to us. He entered this world as one of us, to live among us with all the the frailties that go with human existence. He came to us as a baby, totally dependent on others to care for him. Just think of that. The creator of the world, depending on those he created to care for him. And no blaring trumpet blast, no full-page newspaper ads announcing his coming, just a humble birth in a manger with only a few shepherds who were from the lowest segment of society at that time, only a few of them there to witness it. This is God. Yes, the all-powerful creator God, perfect in his holiness and wisdom and glory, and yet marked by deep humility. And God did this so that we could know him. And not only know what he is like, but to know him in a personal way. It's not only that God is humble, but in his humility, God has reached out to us and invited us to himself. The one who, as it says in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verse 16, he lives in unapproachable light. So we on our own and on our own goodness, we could never approach the holy God Yet this God has approached us and through his humble humble coming to us in Jesus that now enables us to approach God and to have a relationship with God. And this then leads us to the third way that God has reached out to us through the birth of Jesus. The next thing that we see in this picture, if we look with our spiritual eyes, 
And that is we can also see here the love of God. Do you see it there? Ultimately, it's only because of his love for us that God has reached out to us in the coming of Jesus. That's why he revealed himself to us and that's why he came to us in this humble way. It's because of his love for us. One verse of scripture that really sums up what was taking place the night that Jesus was born is the very familiar verse, John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You know, all of us here together tonight, and we don't even all know each other, I'm sure, but we all come from different backgrounds. A number of different countries are represented by us here today. And some of us grew up in in Christian homes, and I'm guessing that some of us grew up in homes where another religion was practiced, and probably some of us grew up in homes where no religion was recognized. And some of us have lived what what many people would consider pretty good lives and others of us probably have had some pretty rough backgrounds and and maybe we've done a lot of bad things. Some of us here tonight have a strong faith in God while others of us, maybe we're not so sure about God. Maybe there's a few of us here tonight who don't even really believe in God but you you were dragged here by a family member. But as different as we all are, there is one thing that is true for each of us, no matter our background or anything else about us, there is one thing that's true for each of us, and that is God loves each one of us. God so loved the world, wrote John, not just a few of us, not just those who are kind of religious, not those who live a clean life, But all of us, God so loved the world. That's why Jesus, the eternal Son of God, became a human being, even a helpless baby. It was an expression of God's love for us so that we then could experience his love in this life as well as for all of eternity. In this picture of the night that Jesus was born. What we really see there is God's love for each one of us. And in his love, we see God inviting us to himself. Now maybe you ask, what does the coming of Jesus really have to do with the love of God? I mean, couldn't God have loved us without Jesus coming into this world? Well, really the answer is no. No, he couldn't have. Because God's love is not simply a sentimental feeling of love. No, God's love is active in nature. And specifically, his is a love that works for the benefit of others, of us. And there's one thing in particular that we need God to do for us. One thing that we need him to do for our benefit, something we could never do for ourselves. And the one thing that we really need God to do for us is to be our Savior. No one can be their own Savior. No one is good enough for that. We all need a Savior. Scripture tells us that all of us have turned from God to go our own way. But we don't really need Scripture to tell us that because if we're honest with ourselves, we know that we have turned from God We know that in many ways we've ignored God, that many times we have chosen our own selfish and sinful ways over God's ways for our lives. Everyone has. And and that turning from God, that, that rebellion against God has caused a rupture in our relationship with God. And that's why we need a Savior, someone who can heal that rupture, someone who can bring us together. And that's why Jesus came. We needed someone who could save us from our sin and reconcile us to God. And in his love for us, that is what God provided in the coming of Jesus. 1 John 4, verse 10, describes it like this. This is love. Not that we love God, 
but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You know, there's no way that that God could claim to love us if he left our greatest need unmet. I mean, what kind of love would that be to leave our greatest need unmet when he was capable of meeting that? Well, God did not leave us in that situation. In his love for us, God sent his son. And from the very beginning, God came with a mission. And that was to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins. For, uh, Revelation 13, verse 8 tells us that Jesus was slain from the creation of the world. Yes, there was a time in history about 2,000 years ago when Jesus was slain on the cross as he bore our sin. But in the mind of God, that was always his eternal plan. It was in his love that God created us. And although we have all strayed from God, God has never stopped loving us. Imagine that um, before, before God created anything, He already knew that we would all turn from him. And he already knew what it would cost to to reconcile us to himself. But God's love for us is so deep that he was willing to do that. He was willing to pay the cost himself as Jesus offered his life on the cross for us. Even before God created anything, God determined that he would do that. Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. And this means that God has loved each one of us from all of eternity. You know, God did not start loving you the moment you were born. God did not start loving you the moment you opened your heart to Christ. No, from all of eternity, God determined that Jesus would die for you. And make no mistake about it, it was God himself who was suffering on the cross. Because there's a profound oneness between God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. Because Jesus is eternally God the Son, it was God who chose to die for the sake of those who he created. There's another picture that that brings this all together. What do you see? What do you see there? Some may simply see some kind of wooden box filled with hay with a shadow of a cross over it. But if we reflect on this for a moment, what we really see in this picture is the eternal plan of God. So simple. A a box of hay with a shadow of a cross but the eternal uh, plan of God. Simple, but so profound. Because there we see God reaching out to us by being born as a human being, even a very humble birth in a manger, to eventually die on the cross for our sins. Jesus was born under the shadow of the cross. That is why he came. In the passage we heard today from Luke chapter 2, it says in verse 15 that when the angels had left the shepherds, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us. You can be sure that the shepherds did not go to Bethlehem just to see a newborn baby. As wonderful as newborn babies are, That's not why they went. No, they understood that God was speaking to them through the message of the angel. And what the angel said to them in verse 11 was, Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The shepherds went that night to see the Savior, the Messiah, who had been promised many centuries earlier and now appeared in the most unexpected way. And then after seeing the Christ child, it says in verse 20 that the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just 
as they had been told. The shepherds didn't glorify and praise God simply because they saw a newborn baby. No, they praised God because they saw the Savior. They saw that God was reaching out to them. Even though at that night they could not perceive that one day it would mean that that newborn baby would die on the cross for them. Nevertheless, the shepherds looked upon that nativity scene and they saw the love of God. They saw the Savior and that God was reaching out to them through this holy infant. There's a song that really captures the essence of who it was that was born in the manger and why he came. It was written, I think, in the 60s or 70s, so it goes back a little ways, but and maybe you're familiar with it, but it's called Love Was When. And some of the words go like this. Love was when God became a man down where I could see love that reached to me. Love was when Jesus walked in history Lovingly, he brought a new life that's free. Love was God, nailed to bleed and die, to reach and love one such as I. That's why Jesus came. It's amazing how we can look at the same pictures, the same objects, and see completely different things. But there is one thing we should all try to see in the same way. On the night that Jesus was born, we see God reaching out to us. In this picture of the nativity scene, and not simply in this picture, but in the picture that's portrayed to us in the words of Scripture, that first Christmas night, what we see is God reaching out to us. God inviting us to himself where we discover the fullness of love, the fullness of joy, the fullness of peace, the fullness of life. Said the night wind to the little lamb, do you see what I see? In this picture, God is reaching out to you. Do you see it? Let us pray. Dear God, even as the shepherds glorified and praised you for all they had seen that night in Bethlehem, so we also give glory and praise to you for reaching out to us in the coming of Jesus. Thank you that we don't have to wonder who you are or what you are like, for you have revealed yourself to us in Jesus. Thank you that in Jesus we see the fullness of your love, of your grace, of your mercy. Thank you that you humbled yourself by becoming a human being, even being born as a baby in a lowly manger so that we can enter into a relationship with you. Thank you for the love that we see in Jesus. Not only that he came to us, but that later he suffered and died for us to forgive our sin and open the door for us to live in relationship with you now and forever. Thank you, Lord, that on that first Christmas night, you reached out to us. May we now respond by by taking your hand and following you into the fullness of life, now and forevermore. Amen. When we see that God loves us so much that he reached out to us by coming to us in Jesus and inviting himself to us, it fills our hearts with joy. So let us stand as we sing our closing hymn, Joy to the World.